start here about two o'clock, but uh, since we're at the top of the hour right now, I want to go ahead and uh, just give you some updates where we're at with swag. Uh, lunch, lunch is almost over, everybody. But uh, if you haven't picked up your fifteen dollar coupon from uh, from B side yet for joining us today from Uber Eats, then please do so uh, as soon as possible. Uh, you just have to install the Uber Eats mobile app. Uh, get logged into it and everything, set your account up, and then you can go to tiny.si slash BSOK. That is tiny.si slash BSOK to claim your $15 coupon for, uh, for lunch. That closes soon. Uh, we had limited, uh, limited uh, availability on that anyway, but I think we still have some left. So if you're still hungry, you haven't eaten lunch yet, go get some lunch on B-Sides. Swag. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Swag as it is pronounced properly. Swag is available if you update your, your B-Sides Eventbrite registration and click on the Swag ticket to, uh, to add your address and everything to that and we will get you shipped out some cool, cool swag including some t-shirts, um, some stickers, and uh, I, I'm not even sure what we're gonna give out this year. There may be some, some peanut M&Ms left over that we might put in the box just to ship with all this stuff so you guys can have some of the snacks that we're having here today. Because uh, I honestly don't want to have to have take all this stuff home today. Uh, Slack, join the conversation. Join the conversation in Slack. We're at uh, slack.teclahoma.org. That is slack.teclahoma.org. And if you guys aren't familiar with Teclahoma, that is the word tech. And then the word Oklahoma minus the OK. Teclahoma.org. And inside of there, you're going to see several of our, our channels right now. You should get added to... Uh, a bunch of the B-Sides channels. You got B-Sides Track 1, Track 2, and Track 3. B-Sides OK Sponsors is one of our channels that you can go reach out to our sponsors and talk to them and ask them all sorts of questions about how they can help you with your companies, uh, whatever you guys need help with. Uh, if you need help with pen testing, come talk to us here at True Digital Security. I'm going to keep throwing that one out there uh, because uh, I like my job and uh, marketing tells me that I have to keep doing this, otherwise they might sack me. Um, Beside CTF, we have a CTF going on right now. Thanks to Rook at Corvid Security. The CTF is going on right now. You have to join the Besides OK dash CTF channel, and then that should be going on through the end of the day. Uh, the points are going down on the scoreboard, so jump in as soon as possible and start solving those challenges. Um, what else do we got? Uh, let's see. Well, it, I tell you, it's 2 o'clock. And since it's 2 o'clock, I believe we have Mr. Hunter Jones on the line right now. Who's going to give a talk? Hunter? Can't, you're muted. Still can't hear you. Could be. There we go. You're okay. just now there. Okay, cool. So I had to go back and reselect my AirPods as the microphone. Oh, I totally get it. All right, um, so Mr. Hunter Jones is, uh, let me get you pulled up here. Hunter's gonna give a talk on the Forensic Odyssey. Uh, and I'm just actually, I'm just gonna let you take it from here, Hunter. Screen shared so we can get the presentation up there. The uh, PowerPoint on your side. We are golden, sir, take it. So. Thanks for tuning in everybody. Uh, today's presentation, for those that didn't get a chance to read the abstract, is going to be on digital forensics, kind of the process that goes into collecting information, the process that goes into investigating information, different tools and tricks of the trade, as well as kind of a look into the future of the field. So without further ado, let's get into it. There we go. Okay. So. For those that aren't aware, uh, my name is Hunter Jones. I've been with Guernsey for about six months now as the lead forensic examiner, and I've been in the forensic field for about two years at this point. In those two years, I've worked over 100 cases, ranging in things as simple as exporting text messages from a phone, all the way up to cases involving Hollywood and uh, different government agencies. Throughout my escapade, um, I have become a state certified expert witness, and all that means is that I was brought in to testify on behalf of evidence I introduced um, essentially, I was brought in as a subject matter expert. So they question, you know, the collection process, what went into the investigation, what you found, things along those lines. As well, I've worked multiple incident responses in the local and not so local areas. Uh, these include kind of triaging scenes, getting networks back up and running, 
figuring out how it happened and uh, giving them controls to put into place to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I also moonlight as a social operator extraordinaire. I have given multiple tours of banks I've never been into. I've given a tour of an insurance agency I've never been to. I have broken into a data center of an electric co-op. And most recently, I was able to breach an internet backbone in a separate state. You know, what are we going to be talking about here? Well, to put it simply, I kind of refer to digital forensics as being the process of recovering and examining data, both present and deleted from a wide variety of sources. Many cases involve deleted data, and a lot of people are under the misconception that if you put something in your recycle bin and get rid of it, that it's gone forever. And that's not necessarily the case, and we'll kind of get into how that works later on down the road. But like I said, just because it looks gone, that doesn't mean that it is gone. Uh, there are lots of different ways to carve data, lots of different tools that do it their own way. And uh, essentially, they come through unallocated space, which is where things that get deleted go. And through that un unallocated space, they look for different signatures, they look for different identifying factors for particular types of information, and then it carves it and pulls it back and presents it to you. And regarding what types of things we can get information from, we have computers and laptops of essentially any operating system, whether that be Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. Now, for the sake of this presentation, we're going to stick to talking about mainly Windows devices, because out of the cases that I've worked, only, gosh, I'd say five or six have had a Mac, and there's only been one or two with a Linux machine. So just for familiarity, and because it's the most common, we're going to stick with Windows. Uh, phones, we work with Apple and Android pretty regularly. Um, Apple more so, but Android is, is kind of gaining some steam, it seems like. And there are also other sorts of information uh, that we can pull from different devices as well, whether it be drones, a camera, a thumb drive, a hard drive, whatever it happens to be, we can probably get it. Lots of ways to get data from a device, and some are easy and some are less easy. The easier ones are gonna be things like a Tableau, uh, Paladin, Forensic Toolkit Imager, things along that line, things that let you uh, kind of plug and play, we'll say, to connect to a device and pull the data from it. Some that aren't so easy involve things such as hardware exploits, typically involving RAM and uh, PCI Express slots. That's something that I've kind of started working on in my free time, but I'm not going to bore you guys with that right now, so we'll stick to uh, what we have. Um, the first step for collecting data, and I would argue the most important, is to, when it's feasible, always have a write blocker. Um, a write blocker is essentially gonna turn the two-lane highway of information, that is read and write, into just read. Whenever you are imaging it, whenever you're trying to pull that information, it blocks the ability to write to the drive, so you don't actually have the ability to modify the data, you don't have the ability to exfoliate the data, and it ensures that the device is collected in a forensically sound manner. Now, there are some very limited situations in which that won't really be possible to do. Um, let's say it's a server that can't go down for one reason or another. You'll have to collect a live image. And in other situations where, let's say the drive is encrypted, but you get cases where we have that. And uh, it, it appears that my audio went down. Um, I'm not sure what happened. Everything yeah, my uh, my AirPods died. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Okay, uh, I'm gonna. I guess just not use the AirPods. So if that becomes an issue, just let me know. Sorry about the the audio there. No worries. Uh, I was actually monitoring two different channels, so I just saw there was issues. I wanted to come back. Go ahead and continue. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, if there's an encrypted drive where you need to get a live image of, of it while it's decrypted. Um, that can be another situation, or if you need to pull the RAM from it to get some other information. And as you can see from below, uh, RAM can be an incredibly valuable source of information, especially in incident response uh, scenarios. The information that you can get from there is gonna be pretty quick to get RAM in a corporate environment. 
is for the most part less than 16 gigs and typically eight is the standard now. So with eight gigs of a device that reads and writes that quickly, you can really image it fast. And because of how small it is and how relatively simple it can be, uh, things like volatility really make it easy to go through and parse through that and uh, find things like active connections with different IPs, um, processes that are running, as well as where those processes are running from, which can be indicative of a breach or at least help you kind of narrow down what the problem is. So now that you have your forensic image, you are good to go. You make sure it's collected soundly, you verified it, everything like that. Now it's time to start investigating. And the most crucial part of any investigation is going to be the tools that you use to conduct the investigation. There are many different tools out there to do many different things. Some of them are open source with a whole bunch of different Linux distributions that um, are designed around forensics. And a lot of them use something as like an autopsy. And some are not open source, things like Celebrite, Magnet Axiom, the paid version of FTK, things like that. And while open source tools can be effective, um, if you're in a government agency like a police department, department policies might prevent open source software from being used. Or if you're at a company, that company might not allow you to use open source software. So you need to be familiar with the policies and procedures that your entity has and work around those. Um, and that's not to say that there isn't a closed source solution for every problem, there typically is. Um, and with that closed source, you have a good, um, you have a good reputation. Anything that the FBI, the OSBI, the NSA, the CIA, anything that people like that use is going to automatically lend a whole bunch of credibility to your case and its forensic soundness. And that really leads me to my next point, which is that trusting your tools is critical. The time to test a tool and figure out if it works, if you like it and how it works, isn't on a case. You need to have a control drive that you know what information is on there, you know what's where, and at that point, image that drive and then go over it. Uh, when I was doing that recently, we're able to find out that antivirus was preventing the tool from running as effectively as it could, so we had to work around that. And that is something that many tools will tell you, is that antivirus will hinder your investigation, if not make it entirely impossible. So it's good to trust your tools, know the quirks and, and idiosyncrasies that they have, and then be prepared to work around them. And next, uh, you need to be familiar with the investigation process and what your role in it is. I see a lot of people get mixed up and believe that a forensic investigator in the digital sense is there to tell you who's guilty, who did what, this, that, and the other. And really what you're there for is to just simply interpret the data and put that out there. It's the lawyer's job to then at that point argue back and forth between what does that data mean versus what it doesn't mean. All you are there is to tell them that it is there, you can verify it's there, and here's how we did that. So, one of the other important things is to always make sure you've been cleared to image and investigate whatever device that you're looking at. This is going to be something that is incredibly important and it's something that you have to look at this through the lens of the opposing side or whoever is working against you, whatever happens to be in this situation, they're going to try to ding you at any given step. So you have to work to perfection or at least the closest approximation of it that you can get. And there was a situation that we ran into recently where an entity contacted us and wanted us to investigate a couple devices. And on one of these devices, we found a personal backup for a separate device that this person had put on a work computer. Now we had the capabilities and permission and everything to investigate the work devices. However, we had to contact them and get some clarification on this personal device that we had found on there. So again, don't get too gung-ho and don't get carried away. Just know what you're there to do and stick within those parameters. But with the image in hand, now we're gonna dig into the data. So again, it's important to establish before you start looking into things, what you're looking for and what the scope of it is. Um, you're not there to learn about this person. You're not there to dig deep into anything that you don't need to. You're simply there to look for what you're looking for. In some cases that is very broad in the cases where you're looking for just evidence of general, uh, a general breach, we'll say. Someone thinks that something might have happened on this computer, but they're not sure what, and they're really not sure when. You do run into those situations, and that is a very wide scope. That's a very large net that's been cast. So you need to be careful to not let that get, uh, get away from you. But in certain situations, you're gonna be looking for very specific things. 
whether that be evidence of data exfiltration, misuse of company assets, anything like that. If you have a specific scope, specific terms, and specific time ranges, it's important to stick within those. So we're going to go over why that is so important here, important here in just a second. So, like I said, you don't need to fall down rabbit holes or chase ghosts. Um, falling down rabbit holes is essentially anyone that's done this for any length of time has done this. It's where you think you're just one step away from that, finding out and cracking the case. So you just keep going that extra step because it's always going to be this next, this next one, this next one. And you can really, really lose, um, lose sight of what you're investigating in the first place. So it's good in those situations to kind of remove yourself, take a step back and really kind of calm down and come back at it again in a second. And chasing ghosts is kind of the same thing, but it's a little bit different. Chasing ghosts is what I call it when, let's say someone brings you a computer and they are convinced that an old high school classmate of theirs has given them a virus or done something. And they know for a fact that this person did it, they give you all this information about them and then they just tell you, go find them. You need to not go into that with the expectation of proving what they're saying. You're not there to prove what these people say is right. You're there to see if it is right. And while those sound similar, there is some distinct differences there that are good to be aware of. You're not there to be anyone's kind of long arm of the law, and you're there to simply tell them what tell them what that truth is, even if it's not exactly what they want to hear, which a lot of the times you're not going to be people's best friend because there isn't that smoking gun that they're saying there is. So regarding all that, it's time to start simple. That's typically the best option. A lot of people are under the misconception that if no one can see them doing it in that moment, no one will be able to see them do it ever. So if someone's been removing data from a company or someone thinks they have been, um, browser history and emails are going to be the best place to start. A lot of companies have things against using Dropbox, using Drive, using any online file sharing tools just because of the security risks it puts out. So if you see something along those lines, that can be a red flag. If you see emails that contain company data to a personal or just a strange email accounts in general, that can also be a red flag. Um, one of the cases that I've worked, if someone was exfiltrating data from their company by emailing it to their personal Gmail account, and that Gmail account was first name dot last name. Uh, it didn't leave a whole lot to the imagination. So it was pretty easy to confirm that yes, this person was indeed exfiltrating data. This person was sending this data to themselves. And here was a complete paper trail that showed what they sent and when they sent it. Outside of emails and browser history, things like Teams, different IMing software, things along those lines are becoming more and more prevalent. And that can be another way uh, that information can escape. So it's good to kind of keep up to date with what uh, software is being used, what that software does, and how that software can impact your investigation. But if the surface level things aren't uh, giving you what you need, you're not able to find any of the real low hanging fruit, that's where a more in-depth look is warranted. And again, like I said earlier, we're going to stick to Windows devices. So some of those more in-depth places, and this isn't an all-encompassing list, this is just some examples. It can include RAM, registry entries, and event viewer. And Event Viewer has a lot of data to parse through, a lot of it less than useful, but there are some specific situations where Event Viewer logs can really help you with your case. So we're going to get into that here in just a second. So if, uh, again, like we talked about data exfiltration earlier, if you expect data exfiltration, but you're not finding anything on internet-based vectors like email, Google Drive, anything like that, looking to the registry can be a really good place whether it be thumb drives, an external hard drive, or in some cases, even an internal hard drive that was removed, the registry is going to keep track of all that. And it lets you get a comprehensive list of not only when it was plugged in, but when it was last connected. And those can piece together a case, and, uh, such as in this example that I'm about to give you. An entity contacted us and wanted us to do an investigation into an employee they said had essentially, allegedly removed the data from the prints. Um, there was no internet anything, there was nothing like that. And something of note is that when this particular employee brought back their device that was a company issued device, there was a missing drive, allegedly. Now, this company did the right thing. It's always good to have a good list of your hardware. 
having a hardware log and really logging of any kind is going to make any sort of investigation much easier. Now the hardware log in this one had the serial number, the device name and model, the company uh, assigned inventory number, as well as a full list of the hard, uh, hardware contained within it, down to the CPU, the RAM, drive, things like that. Now on this hardware manifesto, it showed that this computer was issued with a C drive, an SSD boot drive, just to speed things up, get you a little bit of storage, but it also had a D drive that was a just regular spinner hard drive. Now, this hard drive was not there when the device was turned back in, and the employee said that there wasn't one in the first place. Well, we get the device and we crack it open, and some actual old school forensic techniques came into play here. One of the things that we noticed immediately was that there was a whole bunch of damage done to the drive bay of the computer. Uh, the way that this drive was mounted into the laptop was well, there was a bracket that went on top of it and that had a SATA connector and had a loop to ram and hooked into the front of it. Well, the screws on that bracket that you, so you could remove it were incredibly damaged. They were stripped out and they were scratched up. The bracket wasn't installed correctly uh, when it was put back on. And it looked like someone had essentially used a crowbar or some other grind tool to try and lift that hard drive out. There were some very deep scratches, very fresh scratches, and they were all over the drive bay. It was incredibly damaged. So we documented that. And while that doesn't show for sure that there was an issue, it doesn't show for sure that there was a drive, it does give us a good indication that something was there. So we crack open the image. We start looking through it and we go to the registry and we can see, yep, there's a D drive that matches the make and model that's listed in the hardware manifesto. It was first seen on this day when that device was issued. It was last seen on this day when that employee was let go. And something to note in this is that that employee was let go. The device wasn't able to be recovered from them for multiple days. So in those multiple days, that employee had time to remove that drive. So Again, if you're going to let someone go, it's always good to get that device back as soon as possible. But in situations like this where you can't, this just shows how good adequate logging can be for your cause as coupled with a forensic investigation that is all encompassing and goes through it. So with the registry entries, with the information we're able to see there regarding the specific files that have been on that drive and were recently opened, we were able to paint a pretty good picture of not all of the data that was missing, but a good idea of what the rest of the data on that drive was. And that case was completed and everyone was very happy. Now, another situation is gonna be an incident response type situation where there's a virus outbreak, there's compromised machines in some capacity just running rampant on your network and you need to know what to block, what process is running so you can start cleaning it up and whenever the incident is contained, you can figure out where that, uh, where that rogue process was downloaded from so you can kind of begin to piece together a report that is all encompassing and shows what exactly happened. Um, like I said, there are a lot of different things you can get from RAM, such as the IP that have active connections with that device. Now this can have a twofold purpose, one of which is an IP that you can put in the firewall to block, you can stop traffic going to and from that, as well as you can figure out what that IP is. And if someone was sloppy, that can be used in litigation as a way to prove that this person had compromised your network and they were pulling data from it. The processes and things like that, while well, that's going to be good in the short term to clean it up, remove them, get it quarantined and get it good to go, it does help with the report as well. Because with any incident response, there's going to be a report that talks about what happened, what we learned, and what we can do to prevent this from happening in the future. And the best report is going to be the one with all of the information. So you really need to get the best possible picture of what happened in an incident response, which is why RAM of the patient zero machine is ideal to capture if it's possible. So one of the uh, other things that's kind of overlooked is event viewer. There was a case I worked relatively recently where an employee showed up to work and their computer was logged in and it was on the desktop. Now they knew for certain that they had locked it, that it wasn't open, that nothing like that was going on. So with this person getting there and saying that, they immediately, con or seeing that rather, they immediately contacted IT and IT um, essentially confiscated the devices and shipped them to us. Now they didn't have really adequate logging at this place. And so they weren't able to see on their end where the connection came from, what account it logged into, things like that. So we get the device, we image it, we start going through Event Viewer, and we see that 
there were multiple login attempts that happened in a relatively short period of time. I think it was five or six minutes, there were about as many login attempts. Um, before the one that was left open indefinitely until the employee got to work, the longest login was a few seconds or up to a minute, I think might have been the longest one before this. But even on the one that went until the employee found it, nothing happened. There were no files that were moved, there was no data that was encrypted. It seemed like it had been a remote attack, but no attack had taken place. It was more of a remote recon. It didn't really make sense. So with that information, we go to this, this entity, we tell them exactly what we see, and so they contact their IT provider. And come to find out what had happened was their provider was testing a new update. They were making sure that an update had gone through. So they logged into the machine a few times to make sure that it was there and everything was copacetic. But in the process of this, they did it at a strange hour, and they didn't let this uh, entity know that they were doing it. So that coupled with the inadequate logging, it really, people were kind of flying blind until we got brought in to go over what exactly was there and, excuse me, uh, when exactly it all happened. But we're able to line up the times down to the second with the IT company and our image. So we're able to confirm what happened and confirm that while there was a remote login attempt, it wasn't a breach, there wasn't a compromise. And while they were happy about that, they weren't so happy that they had to go through all this time and money of an investigation. So another thing that is running kind of rampant, I would say right now in the tech world is BYOD, bringing your own device. I kind of more colloquially refer to it as bringing your own device, as there are some issues that you can run into in investigations with BYOD devices. As we've discussed kind of at length here, management of company assets is going to be critical. Maintaining control of the devices and the data associated with them is a huge step in the right direction, and it really should be the foundation of your information security processes. So I say that BYOD is kind of tricky because if it's a company laptop, the, the laptop that I'm streaming from right now, that's a company device. The company owns that. It's theirs. They're just simply letting me borrow it as an employee. So if there's an investigation that needs to take place and they want to remove this computer from my possession and begin an investigation, I can't fight that. It's not mine. I have no legal basis to fight that. But if it's a personal device and there are no policies in place to talk about BYOD procedures, there are no NDM, like mobile device management type things on there, it can make it to where you don't really have a legal basis to pull this device. So BYOD is, it's convenient, but I would argue that there's a direct correlation between convenience and lack of security. So you really need to measure out what's gonna be the most important for your company. Do you want to be as secure as possible or do you want to be as convenient as possible? And that's just something you're gonna to have to discuss internally, but I would say being too convenient means you're gonna be less secure. So if BYOD is rampant, it can make the acquisition of that in those forensic images much more time consuming, if not impossible. If you have to get a warrant, a subpoena, or any legal document like that to actually get a device, whether it be a phone or a computer, that can take time. And in that time, the device can be lost, they can delete and overwrite the data so it can't be recovered, or they could just throw it in a blender or throw it in the ocean, who knows? They have full control over that device and it's theirs to do with it what they will. What they will. So it's good to let employees kind of have their own control of things and let them kind of do things their own way, but you need to make sure that that doesn't come at a detriment to the company or the security of wherever you're working at as a whole. And lastly, always manage how employees are going to access the internet or company information. Um, the principle of these privileges is critical. Now there's a case, and I'll admit that it is extreme, but I think that extreme cases are good to use because it illustrates what can happen in a worst case scenario if you don't institute the proper controls. And worst case scenarios are what you need to plan for, not the best case. So in this case, an entity had contacted us and wanted us to investigate a couple of rogue employees. Now, these employees took BYOD to a level I haven't seen before or since, where they went so far as to contact an internet service provider to have them come out on site and set up an entirely separate network. Um, this separate network had their own firewall, it had their own router, it was completely circumventing the controls of this entity. And with that being said, they immediately started abusing it as you think they would. Um, they were torrenting movies, they were doing peer-to-peer -peer sharing, they were going to the pirate bay, all these things that are typically illegal, especially with the content that was in here, such as movies that had been in theaters for less than a week. 
Um, so they were pirating things that were illegal to have. And because of that, it, essentially it was made worse because it was a government entity. So not only were these people doing this on company time, on company property, with company devices, they were doing it with government devices. And they were putting government information at risk by doing this. So because it was company uh, property they were conducting all these activities on, regardless on if it was a separate network, we were able to go in there, have those devices pulled from them and image them. And we did find full seasons of TV shows, uh, visits to dating sites, visits to pornography sites, all sorts of different movies, and evidence of torrents and other um, illegal activities. So we were able to kind of compile a report that discussed all that. And another thing that was interesting as well is that because they were outside of the supervision of this entity, they were able to connect to the IP-based security cameras that someone else this company had at their home. And we're able to have pictures and verify different identifying details in them to connect it to this person's home. So because there were no controls in place, they were not only able to pirate movies and things along that line, but they were also able to actually spy on another person at this company that they were having issues with. So again, without controls and logging in place, people are really just free to do as they will on your network. And that's not good. That puts you at risk, it puts them at risk, and it puts your clients and uh, your money at risk as well. And kind of tangentially related here, the principle of least privilege is going to be very important. Um, if you have a firm that does multiple things, whether it be engineering, accounting, plane building, anything like that, those departments need to be separated and compartmentalized. There's no reason that anyone in accounting should be able to view the engineering schematics that an engineer would. Likewise, there's no reason that an engineer should be able to view the financial information that accounting would. Not only does this kind of put the company at risk just on accidental data leakage, it makes it harder to figure out if there was intentional and malicious data leaking, it makes it harder to pin down exactly who did it because if everyone can view it and there's not that many logs, which those typically go hand in hand, you're gonna have a very hard time proving who did it, when it was done, and what exactly all they took. So you're, it's good to have your company set up as secure as possible, so that way if something does go wrong, it's much easier to remedy it, and it's much easier to figure out who did it, when they did it, and what exactly needs to happen to that person in the future. So we're finally at the final box, guys. You're at the end of the road. We're gonna talk about kind of the long-term look at digital forensics. Now, I'll spare you guys my soapbox on how endemic personal uh, computers or phones have become in our lives. But it's important to note for this field that of most communication now takes place on a digital medium, at least from what I've seen. And anecdotal evidence isn't worth a whole bunch, but it's what I have to go off. So with that being said, typical cyber crime cases or whatever you wanna call it, aren't the only thing where computers and phones are becoming incredibly important. You have murder cases, drug deals, wrongful deaths, car accidents, whatever it happens to be, because phones are a main form of communication and the main form of digesting and intaking information, they're crucial to cases that it might not seem like they would be in the first place. Because by the principle of digital communication, it all has to be logged. If you send a text message, it's going to be logged on yours as sent, and it's going to be logged on theirs as received. And that's a good thing for the user, but it's a bad thing if there's an investigation going and they have something to hide. Because it's hard to hide a text message that you can put a time on, you can put a date on, you can put a number to and a number from. So I think it's important for people to realize that you need to be proficient in digital forensics, or at least the rough idea of the, the foundation and the principles behind digital forensics. If you're going to be working in law enforcement, if you're going to be working, especially as a forensic examiner, a digital forensic examiner, but that's something that a lot of people miss. They look at phones and things as still newfangled toys that aren't really that important. And I think we need to kind of modernize our thinking in every field. This isn't limited to just one. We need to modernize it in every field, get everyone caught up on exactly how important these are what they entail and things along that line. So, like I said, they're quickly becoming uh, cornerstones of cases, even if it doesn't seem like they would be. Now, if you watch YouTube True Crime at all, I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, Jim Can't Swim is my personal favorite channel. All these cases that he talks about are typically murders or kidnappings and things like that, but phones are the cornerstones of all those cases almost every time. And 
it's important to realize that that's where we're going. And well, not even that's where we're going. It's important to realize that's where we're at. It's only going to get more important as time goes on. And that's why I really believe that as software gets more and more locked down, hardware-based uh, imaging and hardware-based forensics are really the next frontier. It's really the next place we need to be focusing a whole bunch of time, and that's why I'm trying to kind of get there. I want to try to better the field as much as I can because it's something I do care about a lot, and it's something that I think everyone should care about a lot. So yeah, take that for what you will. Now, um, we are done. This is kind of the end screen. This is a sweet building in our architects at Guernsey Design. I don't really know where it is or what it does, but it looks awesome. It's got our contact information down there at the bottom. So if you guys have any questions, anything like that, um, please feel free to ask me, and I would love to answer them. Let me get unmuted here. All right. Well, Hunter, thank you so, so very much, guys. Um, please remember that in the Slack channel, uh, besides OK-Track, excuse me, Track 1, you can ask Hunter questions. You can ask me questions, for that matter, and I can get those over to Hunter. And we do have, um, oh, man. Uh, we got we got about another uh, 27 minutes to fill up before our next speaker actually and we don't have another interview so um any questions you guys have for hunter or anything we'll be glad to answer can you guys hear me okay that's yeah, my other question at this point uh because i know that that was an issue earlier i actually propped the mic up a little bit higher so that people could hear me and turn the gain up a little bit more um so uh, Justin Johnson actually says, says it is important to remind people that the Supreme Court recently ruled that your personal information on digital devices is constitutionally protected. Your provider might know your, 20, your location 24-7, but the government requires a search warrant to get specific information. you care to comment, Hunter? Yes, uh, that is correct and incorrect as well. Um, the Supreme Court has ruled based on the Fourth Amendment regarding uh, unreasonable searches and seizures that a pen or a password is protected by the Fourth Amendment. However, it was recently ruled that if you use a biometric lock, such as a face scan, a thumbprint, anything like that, that isn't protected. So if you do have information on there and you do use a biometric lock, that isn't necessarily protected by the Fourth Amendment. And that's been something that people have been kind of fighting back and forth against, uh, arguing what exactly the Fourth Amendment means and if uh, biometric information is protected by that. So that's kind of an interesting uh, it's a good question. It's kind of an interesting frontier to be paying attention to and really kind of looking at to see where the future of uh, constitutional rights are going regarding digital information. Okay. Um, the other question that was asked by Sinister yeah. Kitten in the Slack channel Hunter, is uh, uh, do companies ever take apprentices for digital forensics? And we have another question after that. Um, yes. Uh, some of them do. We're kind of in the process right now with um, a certain educational entity where we're kind of looking to be um, a way for them to do their practicums with us. That way they can get some real world experience. There's not many places that do that, um, but we're kind of getting on the road to be one of them. And I have to say, I think apprenticeship is one of the things that, uh, I mean, the term I think it's used in, in most tech companies and everything we we're actually looking for internships is what we're looking for so a lot of the times you'll be looking for people who are still in college uh generally speaking i can i can speak for true to a degree um uh we generally for, look for people who are juniors or seniors in in you know in in university and college and everything that are finishing up at least their bachelor's degree and try to bring them on for like uh internships and stuff like that how does guernsey work um, we're still kind of in the process of getting all that figured out right now. We don't have anything too set in stone, um, but with the one entity we have discussed this with, uh, it's kind of the same thing what you're saying. They typically do the practicums, internships, um, whatever you happen to call it. Uh, they'll do that in the junior or senior year, kind of just somewhere in there based on where the middle student is at. Okay. Uh, so Justin Johnson, he was referring to the Supreme Court case a while ago. He says, the case that I'm referring to is to location. Ah, location. Okay. I'll have to look in more into that one. Um, I haven't looked too much into location. I know that uh, there were some issues that arise with that with some of the COVID trackers that people wanted to use, um, but that wasn't something that I looked um, too much into, and I'll have to remedy that. I'll have to start looking at the, uh, the things regarding location now. Okay. Um, so uh, another question. These are some pretty good questions that are actually coming in. I think uh, it's really great that we actually have time to answer some of these questions before uh, Aaron Crawford's up next, guys, so just so you know. 
Um, but uh, what are some interesting things about forensics of BitTorrent data, like logs and other things? Regarding BitTorrent data, um, a lot of people are going to use things like Tor or something like that, or VPNs of some kind to kind of start torrenting things, and that can make those logs hard. Um, typically, it's going to be kind of metadata within the file itself that discusses if it was from BitTorrent or where it came from, and you can kind of also um, link it to BitTorrent or whatever service it is based on timestamps uh, in terms of when it was downloaded, when BitTorrent was visited, and sometimes in the URL they can really show that. So. Um, there are ways to link it, and sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. Uh, forensics isn't really magic, so there are some times you can piece things together, but not say with certainty. You can kind of get uh, circumstantial evidence, if you will. It's a lot like log correlation and everything, correct? Exactly. That's, I, I've seen that a lot. Um, so right. Jess is asking in the skill or in the uh, the skill set <laughs> in the Slack channel. I'm getting my words mixed up. Thanks, thank you, thank you, get us. I just want to say uh, thank you for get us. Uh, uh, the, the B of course stands for beer in B sides. If you're not aware, um, Jess asks what skills or search should someone wait or wanting to get into digital forensics get? Say, um, good for someone who's who's trying to break into you know quote unquote break into digital forensics. What would be interesting for them to take a look at to to start on their journey? Um, is is this in regards to a degree or just kind of in general? Well, uh, specifically, it says skills and certs. So I mean, a skills and certs would probably okay, be uh, uh, you know just anything in that area. We have plenty of time to fill right now, Hunter. So just kind of brain dump if you don't mind. Sounds good. Um, I don't have a degree, so I'm kind of more of a cert and kind of self-taught type uh, person. And I think that's kind of the way of the future. So I think that certs are a good way to go. It's good to have a good baseline and have an accurate and honest assessment of where your skills are at currently. There's nothing wrong with starting small and then kind of snowballing into the bigger things. Things like an A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus, those are all good uh, foundations and good cornerstones of your forensic career. I started out with a Security+, plus certification. And I've expanded that into Celebrite certifications and I'm looking at getting magnet certifications and things along that line. Um, another thing that people kind of overlook and it's a good way to build skills is going to be YouTube. Um, there are lots of people, especially with hardware hacking and kind of more hardware based extraction methods that they really get deep into the creep on YouTube and that's a really good tool to use to expand your skill set. So I think you need to figure out specifically what you're wanting to do, um, what you're wanting to do with the field, how far you're wanting to go with it, kind of get a baseline of where your skills are at, and then build up from there. And like I said, CompTIA certs, uh, the GSEC, Sell and Write, Magnet certs, those are all going to be huge and very important for your career going forward if it's something that you choose to do. I completely agree with that. Um, from the pen testing perspective, this is the, what I have. And I, if anybody watched my talk earlier, I apologize. I'm going to kind of regurgitate a little bit of my background because I actually 100% agree with Hunter on this. I started out years ago with an A-plus certification. Um, and it's funny because I went to school. I, I graduated college about 10 years after I was supposed to. Oh, uh, well, six years after. I was, it took me 10 years to graduate college. So. Um, but, uh, you know, I went through several different certifications and everything along the way. I got an A-plus certification, uh, studied the Network Plus, studied the CCNA, but never actually got those. Um, but the next cert that I got was like a GSEC, and that's a good one to start with. It's uh, the Security Essentials from, from SANS. Um, I was a SANS mentor at some point in time. Now, with that being said, SANS is incredibly, incredibly expensive, so if you can find ways around that, there's there's lots of information you can find on uh, what the SAN stuff teaches without actually getting the certification, but certifications, Hunter, I'm sure you'll agree with this, get your foot in the door at a lot of places. And yeah, so, absolutely. Um, especially if you don't have a degree, um, you're typically fighting an uphill battle with that, um, but recently I noted there was a, an executive order sign that for government positions, uh, real world applicable experience is now weighted over a degree. So that's, that's fantastic. Because, uh, exactly. Like, I think that's very overdue, but I'm glad that it happened right now. Late is better than never. Right. I completely agree with that, actually. And, and Frank C. in the Slack channel actually said YouTube is awesome for all this stuff. And I couldn't agree more. There's yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot of information uh, on yeah. YouTube specifically. And the ones that I tend to stick to more often than not here lately have been stuff along the lines of like reverse engineering and stuff because that's kind of where – that's kind of my passion, which reverse engineering goes a lot into forensic work, though, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I would definitely agree with that. 
Um, I, I was supposed to teach the exploit dev class and everything this year, which is just reverse engineering binaries to find out where the vulnerability is at and try to, you know, try to write exploits for it and everything um, this year. And hopefully, like I said in my talk earlier, I'll teach it next year. I'm going to get it written. I'm going to teach it and everything. I just, uh, this year has been crazy. Uh, last yeah, year, was crazy. this year has been crazier, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, and so um, basically, Certs are an incredible way to gain real world information uh, or, or real world experience depending on the cert. Um, exactly. I highly recommend for anybody wanting to get into pen testing and stuff like that because again, that's where, my, that's where my heart is. That's where my passion is and everything. Look at mm -hmm. OFSEC, uh, the offensive security certs. I've got two of them so far and I'm working on the AWAE right now, um, which is the reason I didn't teach the exploit dev class. <laughs> But I know there's tons of other certifications out there for forensics, for instance. Um, the, there's what, the GCIH from SANS. Um, there's a forensics one from CompTIA, correct, Hunter? I think that they just introduced that one. I, I think it's one of their newer ones. Because uh, I know they just put out a pen test plus as well. So they're kind of expanding from just like the uh, foundation and principles of computers and security and things like that into much more specific uh, facets of them. So there are a lot. SANS has more than I could possibly count. Um, yeah. CompTIA has And um, like I said, if you're wanting to really focus on presence, things like magnet certifications, uh, getting certified for Axiom, things like that, it's going to be pretty good for you, as well as Celebrate. Um, any, Celebrate's really the only mobile forensic solution worth talking about. So if you get a Celebrate cert, that puts your foot in the door in a lot of places, and it puts you ahead of a lot of people. So Where can, where can you get that certification at? Um, you have to get it through Celebrite. Um, oh, okay. It's, um, I think they do some where you can go in person and they have you, uh, they let you use kind of one of their Celebrites and work with that. Um, but I think the self-taught one, you have to have a Celebrite to do that because it makes you kind of image the phone, go through investigation, you have to have their software to do that. But if you go to one of the in-person ones, um, you don't have to have a Celebrite so you can get that cert before you get to a place with a Celebrite. Okay. And that's one of those things, again, you know, having your basics and understanding how all this stuff works, which if you guys are here for B-sides, you probably have a lot of understanding of the basics already. And if you don't, welcome. We're here to help you in any way that we can. Um, but having the basics to understand how all this stuff works at, at a very, very high level can always lead you into the low level stuff to understand how, you know, literally these literally the instruction sets talk to the processor or, or work inside of the processor rather. And stuff like that, which is what you're going to need for any kind of forensics or anything else. You need to understand yeah. how this stuff works. And so, and to be honest with you, right now we're just trying to fill some more time. So let's go back to Slack real quick. Um, is this talk still on proven AI for security? No, I don't. Uh, I don't think we're there just yet. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that that talk is coming up next. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, um, let me double check. I believe that's going to be Aaron Crawford coming up at three o'clock with the proven AI for security. Yes, that talk has not started yet. Uh, let's see, Peter. Uh, no, that talk has not started yet. That actually starts at 3 p.m. here in about 15 minutes. Um, let's see, are there other common errors? Oh, here we go. This is great. Are there common errors or inconsistencies with metadata in BitTorrent? It really depends. Um, kind of, it depends on what that person does in particular. Um, the cases that I've worked with BitTorrent, people kind of, uh, they're a little bit more technically savvy, so they can cover their tracks a little bit better. But as with, regarding metadata with anything, not just specifically BitTorrent, um, what you can gain from that and what exactly it tells you is based on was it deleted? Because typically when it's deleted, metadata is the first thing to go. And if it wasn't deleted, how long ago was it? What settings do they have in place? Things along that line. There's not really, I hate to give an answer of kind of it depends, um, but in this situation, it is one of those times where it does depend. So it's just really going to be relative to whatever case you're looking at. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Frank C asks, are there any good EC council search for forensics? And it looks like there may be a follow up. And he says, I asked because I never hear great reviews about, about them. And I, I assume, Frank, you mean EC Council certs or forensic certs? So I'll just, just go from there. Hunter, do you know of any EC Council? Like, you know, the CEH is the one that I think of off the top of my head for the EC Council. Right. And I know that it was kind of a joke for a long time. Right. I mean, but the thing is, it's like it's, it's a federally recognized certification. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, I think a lot of people have issues with the EC Council because, like, it's just kind of a point and click, or rather, it's a, it's like a multiple choice questions about stuff, and it kind of teaches a base overview of pen testing without actually really getting into the core and, and, and having a deeper understanding of how pen testing actually works. So I, just the books that I read years ago, I don't know how much that's changed in the last five years. Um, but I'm just curious, what, what do you know about the EC Council search as far as uh, forensics and stuff like that is concerned? Um, I'll, I'll fully admit, I don't know um, too much really anything about their forensic search. But one thing I think people kind of get uh, misconstrued because I kind of started out in pen testing and then pivoted to forensics um, pretty early on in my career. And one of the things with the CEH is that it's, it's not meant to be an all-encompassing, you know everything sir. It's meant to be kind of like a security plus or something like that a foot in the door search. It's meant to be something that you can launch from and get better from that point. So I think that any forensic search is going to be better than none. I think it's just, again, good to have an accurate and uh, reasonable expectation for what that search will give you. And I think that you can definitely use an EC Council search to kind of build up your career and then from that pivot to a higher level one or wherever you happen to choose to go from that. But Again, I'm not particularly an expert on EC Council certs. Uh, I don't personally have any. So. Yeah, I don't either, actually. Um, I have heard they've beefed them up a little bit. And apparently, they do have yeah. one. Uh, according to the Slack channel, they've got the Certified Hacking Forensic Investigator, uh, the CHFI. So that might be something to look at. And Hunter's absolutely right. Any certification to help you get in the door is going to be better than absolutely nothing. Um, yeah. any, anything to give you a competitive edge. Uh, because let's face it, we all love to do this stuff. The reason we do this stuff is because we're passionate about it. But quite frankly, even though you're passionate about it, you can play CTFs all day if you want. Uh, you're never going to make a whole lot of money at it. Uh, exactly. You know, like we, we played the, the, the DEF CON CTF this year to try to qualify for, for, the, for the DEF CON CTF. And I'll tell you right now, holy smokes, that thing was ridiculous. And so the only way that I know to win money at stuff like that is to compete in those, you know, those super high stakes competitive com competitions and everything. And the reason we're all here to do this is to make money. You know, we try to turn our passion into a job so that we can enjoy it, get paid for it and help other people, which is the reason we do what we do. So any, any competitive edge you can have to, to help you get in there is just, it's worth it. Uh, you know, whether exactly. it be an easy council or if it's a SAN certification or if it's an offset certification or, you know, security tube certifications. I'll tell you right now, I've taken security tube certifications. I can't remember. I think they may have some forensic stuff on there, but the VEX cert certifications, the stuff he takes you through is particularly in like, I can, I can speak directly to uh, JavaScript and to the, uh, um, the x86 assembly stuff. And I'll tell you right now, that is some good, good information in there. The, yeah, it's, yeah. it's been fantastic to, to work through those. So yeah, don't discount the, any certification. Exactly. And the x86 assembly stuff is actually kind of what I'm looking into now to get more into the hardware-based side of forensics where you're kind of able to uh, breach the system because any drive can be encrypted, any phone can be encrypted, this side of the other, but hardware really can't be encrypted in terms of the way that it interacts between, we'll say, the CPU and the RAM. That's right, all yeah. unencrypted. And so that can be an incredibly valuable source of information if you're willing to really get in there and get that knowledge and learn it. Now, that's a, that's a very deep thing to get into. I would definitely recommend getting some experience under your belt before you start trying to do that, but that's going to be kind of the next wave, I think, is going to be hardware uh, hacking, essentially. Well, that kind of goes into the next question in Slack here. Um, Justin Johnson asks, what directions do you see this field moving into into the future? Uh, specifically, as criminals move to cut past programs, uh, uh, he says cut and I'm assuming cut and paste programs. Do you see that making security against greater threats becoming more difficult as there is a flood of amateur attacks? Um, I, I think that essentially the future of the field is only, it's, it's always a game of cat and mouse, right? Between people that are trying to prevent attacks and people that are trying to do them. Um, I, I think that really the next frontier regarding um, that I think it's going to just boil down to essentially how quick we can get the heuristic analysis kind of AI based uh, antivirus solutions and things like that up to par. Um, the heuristic analysis stuff is a really good way to kind of any abnormalities will be picked up. I think that's kind of the next wave regarding that. If I understood the question correctly, I want to make sure I'm answering the question that you asked. 
yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm wondering too. But I mean, it seems correct. All right, well, guys, we have about uh, nine minutes left until we got Aaron Crawford going to come on and, and talk about uh, proven AI for security. Um, we're uh, we're going to take a brief break, real quick. Hunter, do you have anything else for us? Um, no, not that I can think of. Tune into the Aaron Crawford speech. I talked to him pretty extensively last year. He's a really cool dude, and he has a lot of really good stuff to say. So if that Crawford. Is Definitely too. Crawford's yeah. terrible. He's awful. The other yeah, AA worst guy ever. I'm just I'm trying to I'm trying to hype him up a bit. He's awful. He's terrible. Terrible. He's listening right now. Actually, we've been texting back and forth, and he's. Uh, he, I told him I was like, I'm not letting you in because I don't like you. So, but I have to because otherwise I might get sacked. Hunter, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it, sir. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Uh, we're like I said, we're going to take a brief break. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there he goes. I'm about to kick Hunter. Uh, thanks everybody again for joining us today. I wanna go ahead and just go over. Uh, we don't have any interview this, uh, this last little bit right here. And actually this is the last track for the day. Um, I'm not really entirely sure what's gonna happen at four o'clock. There's usually like a, a little bit of us trying to get together and, and try to, communicate with everybody just how much we really appreciate y'all um let me uh, just real quick thank our sponsors real quick our platinum sponsors fortinet okta guide point security we really appreciate you guys just uh, coming alongside us and, and really helping us out our gold sponsors critical start alias forensics true digital security that's my personal favorite in case you don't know because quite frankly i work for them uh, i have to say that i am legally obligated and if i don't my bosses will yeah, basically, I won't work there anymore. Secure ideas are professionally evil. This guy right here, look at him. I love him. We're not socially distancing people. Yeah. Oh no, we're totally social. This is this is a that was a virtual virtual Sweeney right there is what that was. Pinpoint security. Uh, and our silver sponsors, thank you so much to Checkpoint and our contributing sponsors. And this is uh, the people who actually are really like helping us today with the physical stuff. Uh, Stennett. Uh, advanced pen testing solutions which is of course who chris works for they provided all the zoom stuff for the day and uh, being able to make these zoom calls and have all this happen today uh, and SageNet, uh, SageNet just uh just doing an excellent job providing us a facility here that we can work out of for the command and control center you guys check out the slack channels and everything that we have around today and um we uh we have uh Tons of pictures, actually. I think Melanie Hendricks with SageNet is, has taken some pictures earlier. And um, we have uh, Nathan's been going around taking some pictures and stuff like that earlier. Also, if you check out the stream from earlier, you can see where Nathan took his camera phone or his, his phone on his camera around, basically, and, and tried to take video of, the, of, of all of their operations and stuff. And it just, he's a terrible cameraman, people. That's all I'm saying. Great, great leader. Terrible, terrible cameraman. So we're going to. We're going to hire somebody else to do that next year. Um, we got uh, got one more question in here for Hunter. So, Hunter, if you're still listening, uh, if you want to check the Slack channel a little bit uh, just to see if you can uh, help answer some of those questions real quick. But Yeah, I'm trying to find those. Uh, let's see. We got, it says, uh, thanks for the suggestions. Have a master's degree in, so, in, in uh, computer science. Basically, they, they're way way more um, uh, qualified for this job than I am at this point. Um, took a Coursera class on forensics and loved it. Got all the experience with SIFT, another tool. SIFT is a great tool from what I can tell. It was developed by uh, Rob Lee at SANS. Um, fantastic tool set. Much like, you know, it's, a, it's like an OS that's like a Cali or anything else. Got a tons of tools on there, right? Right, Hunter? Um, I, I think so. That's one that I've kind of started looking into. I don't know too much about it. Um, I typically stick to... Uh, Things like Magnet or anything like that. I haven't used any particular like distributions um, or any Linux tools like that particularly, um, but that's something I'm starting to get into. Yeah, we t I totally understand. Well, Hunter, again, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and bring on Aaron Crawford and try to get him set up here. And so, um, Hunter, have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you. You too.